Chapter Seventeen of the Man Who Ended War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Man Who Ended War by Hollis Godfrey. Chapter Seventeen. As we stood there in the hush that followed the last bars of the song, Tom came towards us. Dorothy turned to him, starry-eyed, and he looked quickly at me. I nodded. Tom smiled widely as he stretched out his hand. Nobody else in the world I'd as soon would have her, old man, he said, as he nearly wrung my hand off. Then, turning to his sister, Well, little girl, so you've waked up at last to the real state of things? Dorothy clung to his arm. Tom, dear, I have, and I'm very happy. But, her voice broke, it may only be for to-night. Jim leaves at once for the fleet. He's going out to watch the battle, and if the man sends out his waves to sink those ships, I'm afraid he'll sink every other boat anywhere near. This, my children, said Tom, with a flowing gesture, is where your old Uncle Thomas steps in as the benevolent fairy who saves the handsome lover of the beautiful young princess. Dorothy looked at him, her whole soul in her eyes. Tom, don't joke. Have you any way by which Jim can go and be safe? I can't ask him to stay behind for me when he ought to go. Dorothy, said Tom seriously, I think Jim can go and be perfectly safe. I thought this whole business out, coming over in the boat. Not being completely and totally blind, I foresaw the inevitable occurrence which has inevitably occurred, and I didn't want to lose Jim for my own sake, as well as my sister's. I've had this on my mind ever since we left Portsmouth. I knew he'd think he ought to go. So as soon as I reached Folkestone, I had a little yacht built, a sloop with an auxiliary motor which hasn't a nail in her. She's all wood, rubber, and canvas, except the engine, and if the engine disappears, there's a set of rubber valves that instantly closes the shaft hole. The man can come right up alongside, stand up, and throw waves at her, and she can't sink. I had a wire from there tonight that she was done. They've been working on her 24 hours a day since I started her, and she's a mighty nice little boat. The crew is engaged, and all Jim has to do is take possession. That ought to save the boat, Dorothy said, shaking her head sadly. But how can you save Jim from the fate of Dr. Heidenmuller, or of the men on the battleships who died as he did? You never did have much opinion of my brains, Dorothy, said Tom. Don't you suppose I thought of the effect those waves would have? You know none of the other ships in Portsmouth Harbor were injured. When the German ships disappeared... That proves that the man has some way of directing his waves, so he may not hurt Jim at all. But I didn't take any chances on that. I've had a cage of Kaima built over the cockpit, and everything is arranged so that the boat can be run without going outside that cage. Dorothy heaved a sigh of relief. She bent forward and kissed Tom in the full face of the assembly. Tom, you're the finest, best man in the world, except one. That's it said Tom with a grin. Second place for old Uncle Thomas now. But Tom, I said, I follow the boat construction all right, but for heaven's sake, what is this kaima that I've heard so much about, and what's the use of the cage? Oh, I forgot you might not understand that, said Tom. You know, or you ought to know, it's in every school physics, that if you put a cage of a conductor like copper around any instrument which is easily affected by any electrical discharge, the electrical waves spread out, follow the surface of the cage, and don't penetrate the interior. The instrument is wholly unaffected. Well, COM is the newest organic conductor. It acts the same way with any radioactive waves. They spread out all over it, and it can't get through. I've had a cage built of it to insulate you and everything else that's inside. Why wouldn't it work around the battleships, then? I asked. Because the battleships are made of steel. And if you put a cage like that around them, they could hardly move. It only worked on your boat because it's wood outside. Tom, I said gravely, I imagine your forethought and knowledge will save my life. I know it will, said Tom cheerfully. Now, what time do you leave? In fifty-five minutes from Charing Cross on the Channel Express, I said. We'll go with you to Folkestone, said Tom. Of course, said Dorothy. A few minutes at the Savoy, a brief ride down the lighted strand in the midst of the noisy crowds, a moment in the rush of the station, and a long ride in the darkness in a full compartment brought us back to Folkestone. All the way down I held Dorothy's hand in my own. All the way down her warm body was close to mine. 
despite all Tom's precautions, something might go wrong. But if it ended tonight, we had this, and hope persisted that it would not end tonight, that, on the other hand, this was the beginning of many happy years. The crew of three was on board the little yacht, which looked no different in the dark from any other boat, though as we came alongside in the skiff I could just see a cage of some dark substance above the cockpit. We entered through a lattice door toward the bow, and Tom, for half an hour, examined every part of the boat with a lantern the chyma screen most vigilantly of all. Dorothy and I sat close together, watching the lights and their reflection in the water. All about the pier was hurry and movement. Three tugs, bearing correspondence, passed us as we lay at anchor, and half a dozen dispatch boats and cutters. Tom came up to us at last. Jim, if you keep the door of the cage fastened, nothing can happen to you. Don't be foolhardy, though, for my sake, said Dorothy. "'Come, Dorothy, we must go. "'It's time for Jim to start,' said Tom gently, "'and I strained Dorothy to my heart "'and felt her wet cheek against mine. "'I'll be back safely, dear love,' I whispered, "'as I helped her into the waiting boat. "'Tom wrung my hand as he left. "'Jim, I'd go with you, "'but I think I ought to stay with Dorothy. "'I know you ought,' I replied, "'and they cast off. "'As we started off into the blackness, "'Dorothy's clear, "'Till we meet again, dear,' were the last words that reached me. Our London office had been able to obtain pretty definite information as regards the whereabouts of the fleet, and our little boat was a marvel of swiftness. So it was with no great surprise that, as the morning dawned, I saw far ahead of me, off the port bow, the rear ships of the squadron going slowly ahead, and shortly after came in sight of the whole fleet. My binoculars showed the greatest spectacle I had ever beheld, from east and west, from north and south, had come the hurrying ships to guard the coasts of the great island empire from attack. I counted forty mighty ships as I gazed. In regular formation they went onward, slowly, disdainfully, proudly. Somewhere to the north, beyond that gray line which bordered my view on every side, another fleet was coming. At best it was to be the greatest trial of naval strength the world had ever seen. All other naval battles would sink into obscurity before this, in which were met the utmost resources of Germany and England. At worst, it would be a series of dumb, helpless disasters, as the fleet, stricken by an unseen, unknown foe, would perish. Near me were two of the boats bearing men from the papers. The men on them jeered as they saw our dark cage, and passed uncomplimentary remarks on the appearance of my boat. I kept silence, watching the line of sky and sea. Out on the farthest point, at last, I saw a dot, and then half a dozen more, then more, and I counted up to thirty. Over on my right, a great splash of water rose, and a dull reverberation sounded. Germany had fired the first shot. The flagship of the English admiral was nearest me, on the extreme left of the line. As I watched, I saw the great ship turn slightly, and I knew by the sound that they had fired in return. Sight availed nothing in telling whence came the shot, for the newest smokeless powder left no trace. The ship swung back on her course, the great flag of the empire hanging at her stern, scarce lifted by the breeze. I could see figures, through my powerful glasses, hurrying about the decks, and three or four officers on the bridge peering through their glasses at the enemy. I had focused wholly on the British flagship and watched intently for her next move. Suddenly my lenses grew blank. I was staring at sea and sky. The gray waves, rising and falling, filled the field. The battleship had disappeared. I dropped my glasses in utter amaze. I found myself once more repeating the words of Joslin concerning the Alaska. Vanished like a bursting soap bubble. I looked to right and left. I raised my glasses. Of all that company of men, of all those implements of war and of destruction, not one thing remained. Yes, there was a dark spot on a lifting wave. Eagerly I trained my lenses on it. Now it came up on a higher wave, a gleam of color. It was like cloth. Again it rose. It was the flag of England. Alone it had survived. The man was at work. Where would he strike next? The rest of the fleet went on as if no blow had come. Not by a sign did they show what had come upon them. I glanced at my wire screen. 
and at my crew who stood in a huddled group. The correspondents in the boats nearby were standing with white faces, peering ahead. I turned my glasses on the German fleet. The leading ship was coming forward under full steam. A shot struck just to my right, and I realized that peril might come from other sources than from the man who was trying, no, who was, stopping all war. But it was all in the game of life. My part in the game just then was to be at that very place, and I thrust back the thought of parting with Dorothy that, despite myself, arose. I found myself counting aloud. Through my glasses I gazed fixedly at the German ship as she came on. Then, as before, came the utter blankness, the grey sky, and the waves rising and falling. One English ship and one German. Where would he strike next? As I asked the question, another English ship disappeared more swiftly than a cloud of light smoke scattered by the wind. I found myself counting aloud. In a state of utter unconsciousness as to anything else, I gazed fixedly to see which would go next. Four, I counted, as a German cruiser off on the right went down. Five, six! They were going at the rate of one every two or three minutes now. The man must be in one spot, and he has the range now, I said to myself, as two more ships disappeared. Those ships that remained were firing rapidly. Now and again a shot would hit, and a cloud of steel fly out from a turret, or a big hole appear in the side. Their brothers were dying an awful death. The sister ships of the fleet were disappearing before their eyes, but the men who directed those gray bulldogs of war kept on. In a perfect frenzy of excitement, I cheered aloud, Oh, plucky! plucky i cried as the squadrons closing their thinned ranks bore down on each other twenty had gone from eighty-two destroyed by this wonder worker ten of the rest were in sore straits shots were falling on every side of me but in the mad excitement of the moment i heeded them no more than if they had been paper pellets then the death-dealing machine seemed suddenly to accelerate its action twenty-five twenty-six Twenty-seven, twenty-eight, I counted slowly. The fleets never changed a point of their course. Not by a gun was the fire slackened, save in a few ships disabled by the enemy. The fortieth ship had disappeared for ten minutes. Then, as by a common understanding, the fire of each side slackened for a moment as the ships, closing up their ranks, maneuvered for new positions. In the lessening din I could hear the chug-chug of the little motor of our boat. That sound always carried me back to the night when Dorothy and I sought the man who saw the Alaska go down, the dark Jersey shore, the little launch, and Dorothy beside me suddenly rose before my eyes, and I was there, not in the midst of this awful carnage. But it was only for a moment. The pause in the work of destruction ended almost as it began. One after another— Twenty-two ships more went down, and the antagonists, who had started with eighty-two of the proudest ships that any empire ever sent forth, were reduced to a shattered remnant of twenty. Then suddenly they gave way. Flesh and blood could stand no more. Slowly, but proudly as ever, and with no haste of flight, the Germans drew off to the north, the English to the south. As they parted, another ship and yet another disappeared. I groaned in impotent agony. Spare them! Spare the rest! I cried wildly. Can't you see they have given up the fight? Remorselessness in his purpose, the man went on. Again and again, with measured blows, he struck the retreating fleet. One by one, their existence ended. And now the sunlit ripples of the channel rose and fell, where a moment before had sailed these massive hulks. I veiled my eyes at the close, but opened them as I felt a touch on my shoulder. "'Are we to be killed too, sir?' said my skipper, with twitching lips and corded brow, where the cold sweat stood in great drops. "'Can we go now, sir?' I nodded numbly as we started. The only boats in sight were two boats of the newspapers that had lain in apathy near us, and as they saw us start, their skippers started too. The correspondents on their decks sat in stricken attitudes. Not one was writing. They crouched, huddled together like men dying from cold. The three boats ran towards shore, side by side. 
with fixed gaze i followed the one on the right suddenly she also disappeared i fell into a wild rage you fool you fool i cried shaking my fist don't you know a non-combatant the men on the boat to the left rose in an agony of alarm shouted incoherently waved handkerchiefs my fury suddenly became extinct and i watched them apathetically it would be their turn next or ours i had lost all faith in tom's protective schemes one thing ran back and forth in my brain if i had only married dorothy before i came she could have worn black now as it was would she or wouldn't she <laughs> that was the one thing which distressed me they say a man awaiting instant death thinks over all in his past life i didn't i only worried as to whether dorothy would or would not wear black i looked up wearily the sea was blank the other boat had gone so you went first i said calmly enough now i've always wondered what the next world was like now i'm going to know ceaselessly went the chug chug of the engine back and forth into the shuttle of my thought went the jersey coast and the problem of whether or not dorothy would wear black the noise ceased in an instant, and I wondered at it dully. The crew sat heavily in the stern, the skipper holding the wheel. I could see his brown knotted hands white with the anguished grip with which he clasped its rim. We lay in the long swell of the channel in utter silence. Of all those thousands, we were left alone, rising and falling on the billows, absolutely without energy, and without the slightest desire to act. The motor stopped. We could hoist the mainsail from the cage, but we thought of no such thing. For minutes, which seemed like hours, we lay there while I gazed indifferently at the water. A hoarse cry from the skipper aroused me. Looky there! he shouted. I turned at the command and started. Scarce a hundred yards away was the conning tower of a submarine above the waves. Its top was open, and a man's head, the face, masked with huge goggles, faced us. As I gazed with open mouth, the head disappeared, the top closed, and the conning tower sunk beneath the waves. I had seen the man. The sight somehow galvanized me into energy. Now I had seen that the antagonist was a human being and not a superhuman power. I would fight for my life. I ordered the sail raised through the cage, taking great care not to disturb it, and we started slowly back to Folkestone. Hours later, as we came up towards the harbor, I saw a yacht approaching. On the bridge were three figures. There was the flutter of a white dress beside the man at the wheel. As they came nearer, I saw it was the yacht I had chartered for our hunt in the channel. The man and the girl on the bridge were Tom and Dorothy. As they came alongside, Tom called, "'What happened?' I raised my head. We four are all that are left, I said sadly. End of chapter 17。Chapter 18 of The Man Who Ended War。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Man Who Ended War by Hollis Godfrey. Chapter 18. As I came over the side of the yacht, Dorothy was at the rail and in a moment was in my arms. Thank God, thank God you're back, she murmured. You are back and the awful waiting is over. But how many wives and sweethearts will wait all the rest of their lives? Tom was but a moment behind his sister. "'Do you mean to say that every boat without exception has gone?' he questioned. "'Every one within my range of vision. "'Between eighty and ninety in all,' I answered. "'Good God, what a catastrophe!' said Tom dazedly. "'I can't realize it.' "'My little yacht was still alongside, and the skipper now hailed us. "'Mr. Orrington, sir, could somebody else take our boat in, and could we go with you?' i think sir we'd feel easier if we could go with you there was something to do in a few minutes an exchange had been made and my crew was on the larger yacht as they came over the rail tom met them with a low request to keep their mouths shut don't fear us said my skipper we're alive and that's all we ask for we don't have any call or wish to talk about it do we mates 
The other men shook their heads dumbly and went slowly to their places. What became of your propeller? asked Tom, coming back towards us. Disappeared. Your rubber valves closed the hole. Then he tried to sink you? Undoubtedly, I answered. It was your wooden boat and cage of Kaima which saved me. As we made for Folkestone, we met other boats hurrying out on the channel. Tom had ventured out farther than anyone else. One by one they hailed us, but our captain gave them no news and made on. I wish I knew what to do, I said wearily. I can't write this thing. I feel stunned and broken. I'm not sure what I ought to do anyway. Any ordinary or even extraordinary thing is proper journalistic stuff, but this is too big, somehow, for individual use. Yet the one thing that ought to be done is to get the news to the world as soon as possible. I don't know what to tell you, said Dorothy, hesitatingly. Isn't your London correspondent to be in Folkestone waiting for you? Yes, I said. We'll ask him. You and I will go ashore, and Tom can put out with the yacht. Then there will be no chance of the sailors telling anything. All right, I answered. I don't seem to care what happens. Folkestone Pier was a black mass of people looking out to sea as we came in, and a surging crowd came towards us as Dorothy and I landed, while our boat, with Tom in the stern, shot back towards the yacht. Had it not been for three or four policemen, we could not have forced our way through the jam. But by their aid we managed to struggle through, shaking our heads in response to the thousand questions. As the human tide ebbed back towards the end of the pier, I heard my name and turned. It was Maxwell, our London correspondent. "'What news?' he asked eagerly when he reached me. "'I'll tell you if you get us out of this crowd,' I answered. "'I've got a motor here. Come on,' he said, and we made our way out boarded the motor and started slowly off. I looked at the chauffeur. "'Run out to a quiet place where we can be alone, will you?' I said to Maxwell. In a few moments we had cleared the town and were on the bluff above the sea. There was no one around. "'This will do,' I said. As we descended, Maxwell looked questioningly at Dorothy. Oh, "'This is my fiance, Miss Haldane,' I explained. "'I forgot to introduce you. She knows the whole story.' Just where we paused, an iron seat faced the wide expanse of blue and shining water, and for a moment I gazed out over the channel and breathed a silent prayer of thanksgiving for my escape, of remembrance for the men who lay beneath that flood. Then I turned and began my story. Ere I had spoken a dozen words, Maxwell had his notebook out, writing rapidly. Throughout he wrote without a question, without a word. As I ended, he closed his notebook slowly. "'What we want to know, Mr. Maxwell,' said Dorothy anxiously, is the right thing to do. Should this go straight to the paper, or ought it go first to the English government? You see, there's probably no living man who saw this except Jim and his sailors, and we want to do right. We want to do right by the men that died and the people that remain. Wise, able, thoughtful, a scholar and a gentleman, a great journalist, a man who counted among his friends the greatest men of two countries, no man could be found who could decide such a question better than Maxwell. He looked at Dorothy. That was the very question in my mind, Miss Haldane, he answered. But I think there's only one answer. I believe we should take this straight to the king. He is at Buckingham Palace, and I believe we should go directly to him with the story. I have met him a number of times, and I know we can get an audience immediately. I'm very glad you think so, I said. How about the trains? We can do better in my car, he replied. Ten minutes for gasoline, and we started off through quiet villages where red farmhouses stood framed in vivid green, by tower and manor house embowered in ancient oaks, through hedgerowed land and city street we sped, till the rows of the villas, each modeled from a single type, showed the outskirts of London. Then, at a slower pace, we passed through a smoky fog, across the river by the abbey, to the long front of Buckingham Palace. All the way we sat silent under the heavy burden of the news that brought the end of those long centuries of unconquerable British power. No enemy who could be conquered had they met. The day had come for peace, and Britain and Germany had been the greatest sufferers in the change of epochs. Past the red-coated sentry to the door of the palace we drove. A few words on a card brought a secretary with a startled face, and scarce five minutes had elapsed before Maxwell was ushered in. Dorothy and I remained in the car. As Maxwell left, he remarked, Orrington, 
under any ordinary circumstances i'd ask for an audience for you but now there's no time to be lost i can get an immediate interview alone where i could not get one with you that's all right i said apathetically i'm glad not to be obliged to move we waited before the palace the better part of an hour before the door opened and maxwell emerged as he came towards us i could see that he was blowing his nose vigorously and that his eyes were moist he got into the car without a word but as we swung over the bridge into the park maxwell made his first remark staring off into vacancy i always thought the king was about the finest man that england held now i know it that was all i ever learned of the interview but as we came by the abbey i heard a newsboy crying destruction of the fleets and i looked inquiringly at maxwell he nodded in reply we published it first i telephoned the news from the palace weary and sad as i was broken with the horror of the day my purpose had become stronger than ever before as we ran slowly through whitehall and around to the savoy the thoughts of the past were disappearing in cogitations as to the effect this would have upon our search for the man though every battleship in the world was sunk my purpose held good i would find the destroyer the next morning came a startling announcement the king of england the president of the united states the president of the french republic the mikado of japan the czar of russia issued immediate call for representatives of all nations to assemble at the hague to consider the question of disarmament that in itself differed but little from other summonses which had resulted in academic discussions but the paragraph which succeeded the call was one of the most extraordinary the world had ever seen the five rulers who issued this invitation each pledged himself to do everything in his power to bring about complete disarmament and to end war in the whole world in view of the urgency of the situation the meeting was to be held in a month at the hague it was soon learned that the initiative in this step had come from the king of england that the four other rulers had gladly joined with him in the action when asked concerning it by wireless and that the emperor of germany had been invited to make one of the number but had refused that seemed to leave germany as the stumbling block in the way complete disarmament was wholly possible if every nation were to agree if a single powerful nation refused to disarm it became practically an impossibility for no nation would give up her defences with a powerful armoured foe at her gates i had scarcely finished reading the account in the morning paper as a waiter approached with a wireless message from the office take three weeks vacation and then go to the hague as special correspondent for peace conference confound it i ejaculated as i read the missive look at this and i passed the paper over to tom and dorothy tom's face fell of course it's a good thing in a way said tom but it takes you right off the track of the man i refuse to go off the track i said warmly i'm going to wire them back refusing this oh i wouldn't do that interrupted dorothy eagerly you stand almost or quite as much of a chance to get the news of the man at the peace conference as elsewhere we can take the wave measuring machine right over to the hague and work from there besides i want the three weeks vacation better take the vacation and put it in with me down at cambridge remarked tom they're doing some work in one of the colleges that might help me with the denkel machine i'd like to watch it a while and see its bearing on the case dorothy would have enjoyed it once but now she's hopeless you two could come down though and roam round for three weeks there as well as anywhere else it's a jolly country and we'll have a good time well if you feel convinced it's the thing to do i'll do it i said resignedly but i want to put in three weeks here in london getting things together we've never run down the cragent clue yet you are neither of you going to do any such thing remarked dorothy firmly i'll tell you what you are going to do for the next three weeks you're going to paris with me oh pshaw said tom disgustedly paris as a whole i want to go to cambridge do you like paris jim not particularly i said with some hesitation but then we're going said dorothy what for said tom argumentatively well if you must know said dorothy blushing i want to shop tom burst into a roar of laughter and i looked at him in bewilderment he leaned over towards me got the cards engraved yet jim dorothy blushed still more i saw a sudden light of course we go to paris i said enthusiastically 
It's the place of places. And you'll sit around for hours, waiting in a dinky little cab or in a motor car on the Boulevard Houseman, while Dorothy spends her patrimony inside. Is there a special duty on Trousseau, Dorothy? he asked, with an affectation of seriousness. Oh, I wish you'd stop, said Dorothy emphatically. All right, said Tom. Only I thought I'd better wire my banker to see if my balance would leave us anything to go home on. Three weeks in Paris, hours when I sat and smoked outside big shops and little shops, afternoons in the bois, little dinners à trois at great restaurants, life and light and joy, three weeks with Dorothy, then the day express to The Hague, and a week of watching the arrival of the envoys, while Tom, who had run across an old assistant of Carl Denkel's, set up the wave-measuring machine and spent his days working over it, in an attempt to widen its scope and bring it nearer to its ever-present mission. It still remained our chief reliance for our search. Anxious as I was to return to the quest of the man, the work at The Hague proved fascinating in the extreme. My daily report told of the coming of representatives from almost every nation, and, best of all, told of the free and full powers given them to agree to complete disarmament, provided it could be universal. Day after day, in the month which intervened between the calling of the convention and the opening of the meeting, had come reports of parliaments and congresses hastily gathered together to consider the question, and of their eager passing of favorable votes. One by one they came, till every nation had joined in consent, save one. Germany still held aloof. Since the disappearance of the fleets, the German emperor had made no movement to advance the war, but kept his armies gathered, his transports riding at anchor in the ports. The Reichstag met, and discussed most favorably the call to the Hague, waiting anxiously for some sign from its imperial master. But none came. In absolute seclusion, in a lone castle in the depths of the Black Forest, he sulked like Achilles in his tent. The first day of meeting came with every power represented save Germany. The second and third passed with no sign from Berlin. On the fourth I began to see signs of difficulty. It was evident that the consent of the German Empire was a sine qua non. Delegate after delegate arose and expressed the eager desire of his country to disarm and bring about universal peace, provided, and the provided was emphatic, all other nations did the same. On the evening of the fourth day an American delegate rose, and by a powerful speech so roused the assembly that a delegation was appointed to meet the German emperor and ask him, in the name of the conference, to join with the other nations. After the delegation was named, the meeting adjourned for three days until they could return. On the night when the delegates were to return, I was in my place in the correspondence section of the hall of the conference. The meeting came to order, the preliminary business was finished, and the presiding officer arose to say that the delegates had been delayed in returning, but had telegraphed that they would be there within an hour. He had scarcely finished speaking, when a door opened and a marshal announced, The delegation sent to His Majesty, the Emperor of Germany. Travel-worn and weary, the five men walked up the aisle to the space at front. Gentlemen, are you ready to report? said the presiding officer. We are said the head of the delegation. The Emperor of Germany refused absolutely to see us, pleading an indisposition. We were unable to obtain any satisfaction. The grave assembly rose like the sea. Shouts, cries, requests for recognition came in one clamorous volume, and the president sounded his gavel fiercely. The excitable Latins were shouting recriminations. It looked as if the seething mass would break up in utter disorder, and the great conference would end without result. Far off by the door I could see a marshal forcing his way through the crowded aisles, imploring, struggling, fighting. He reached the rostrum, mounted it, and spoke in the president's ear. With a tremendous effort he shouted, Silence for important news! Little by little the crowd stilled. In a resonant voice came the words, An envoy from the Emperor of Germany desires to address the conference in person. A hush came over the assembly, a hush so sudden, so profound, that I could hear the scratching of the fountain pen with which the secretary before the president wrote the words. The aisles cleared, and the ordered assembly sat silently in their seats. The great door opened, and preceded by a corps of marshals, the envoy from the great Hohenzollern entered. The stiff, unbending figure, 
the haughty head the piercing eyes and high upturned moustache of the field marshal envoy showed his imitation of his master the warlord proudly as on parade he paced to the space where the president who had descended to the floor to greet him stood he bowed coldly and turned my master has sent me here he said abruptly to address your conference these are his words i have believed this war that armies made for the best good of my state i believe it still i do not believe in peace but i cannot expose my navy to destruction my sailors and my soldiers to death i therefore agree to peace my army shall disband my fortifications be torn down my battleships sunk or turned to peaceful ends my reichstag will have confirmed my words ere now as one man the assembly arose and cheered never in his own city or from his own troops came heartier greetings than that which rung out for the last ruler to take up the cause of peace the field marshal stood there while the tumult raged his hands resting on the hilt of his sword erect as ever impassive as ever as the cheering ended he bowed to the assembly turning he bowed to the president and then with martial step he slowly withdrew the delegates from germany arrived the next day with power to disarm and the business of signing the agreements and plans of disarmament went on so rapidly that the conference was able to adjourn in but a few days time the day the conference closed i rushed back from the telegraph office the moment i had sent off the last word of my final despatch i found tom and dorothy in the laboratory there thank goodness i cried exultantly that's over now i can go back to the hunt for the man with an easy conscience what do you think that next move ought to be hold on till we finish this said tom we'll talk things over as soon as i get this screw set i watched him idly as he worked what is he trying to do now i asked dorothy just as i spoke tom moved his hand the low buzz of a rumpkoff coil broke in on the silence of the room and the glorious beauty of the tube of unknown gas that we had found in heidenmuller's laboratory illumined the place why there's the gas tube i cried in amazement yes said dorothy from that tube has come a marvellous development of the dinkel apparatus tom has been able to receive with it right along but never send one day he thought of placing that tube of gas in the circuit and now he can send as well as receive tom has done a big thing he can reverse the action of the machine not only receive a message from any place but shoot a wireless back across space and have it strike exactly where he wishes it's really a wonderful development but i don't see how it's going to help us find the man and i don't want to give up there tom is finishing we'll talk things over now if the man's crusade were not over it might be even more effective i remarked reflectively it would have been strange enough if we had found him by means of the gas released from the metal destroyed by his terrific power it would have been answered dorothy i stood watching tom as pipe in mouth he set the revolving belt in motion and watched the moving cylinders to what strength of wave is it adjusted i asked i've put it on the high said tom it's fixed for the man's waves i've got one new dodge though among others I have it arranged so I could have told at any time whether the man was sinking a ship or just experimenting. It's so delicate that when his waves strike a ship, the machine can tell it by the slightest loss in power. See here, he turned on the switch in its revolution. It's this. Flash went the beam. A groan burst from Dorothy's lips. He's at it again. There's a ship gone down. Tom's face was ghastly. That's right, he said where is he five minutes calculation brought it he's in tokyo said dorothy tom nodded what a fiend to have loose in the world here his mission is accomplished and war is over and he keeps on dorothy sprang from her chair no it isn't that i'm sure of it he doesn't know that war is over it must be that we must tell him of it End of chapter eighteen Chapter 19 of The Man Who Ended War. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Man Who Ended War by Hollis Godfrey. Chapter 19. What is your idea, Dorothy? asked Tom gravely. This last catastrophe, coming when all danger from the man who had stopped all war seemed past, had sobered us all. You said there was a mast with wires beside the conning tower of the submarine that time you saw the man, didn't you, Jim? she asked. I nodded. Well, that mast was the aerial of a wireless. I don't know what he uses it for, but apparently he has one. Now that we have the Dinkel apparatus fixed to send waves to any given point, we can send off waves of all kinds to Tokyo, calling him and recalling him until we get a wave which his receiver will take. Then we can set up a straight wireless receiving station here to take his answer. What will you say to him? Tom asked. I'll just say, to the man who stopped all war, war is over, all nations are disarming, reply to us. It's worth trying anyway, said Tom, with an air of finality. I'll go right to work setting up a receiving plant. I can do that all right, but I can't send Morse through our machine. If you look out for the construction end of it, I can send Morse over an ordinary key, I suggested. Then that's settled, said Tom. I can set up a wireless that will receive any wave sent from Japan, and I can set up a duplicate of the wave measuring machine that will send messages straight to Tokyo by means of an ordinary Morse key. Where had we better run our aerial? Down by the shore, said Dorothy. We want to avoid the interfering action of the currents that are loose in and around the city. There's one thing you've forgotten, I interposed. If the man is in a submarine, your message may not reach him underwater. He'll spend most of his time on the surface, said Tom. With a first-class submarine, he could spend two months underwater at a time, but he wouldn't want to. Don't spend any more time in discussion, boys, interrupted Dorothy. We must reach him the first moment possible, before any other ship goes down. Meanwhile, Jim, you want to get this to the paper, don't you? I surely do, I responded, and I hurried off to wire the London office. I sent my telegram over our private line and waited for the answer. In five minutes it came back. Too late this time, my boy. Japanese first-class battleship disappeared in broad daylight in the harbor of Tokyo. They sent it on here immediately, and we have had it for some minutes. Rest on your laurels, signed Maxwell. Well... I thought to myself as I returned. I can afford to rest on my laurels. There's not a country in the civilized world where my name is not known today. My mail was full of requests for interviews, for magazine articles, for lecture tours. I was a made man, and as I mused on these things, I walked on somewhat more proudly than my wont. But as I thought over the experiences of the last months, saw in what an extraordinary fashion fortune had played into my hands, saw how Tom Haldane had saved my life by his shrewd foresight and scientific knowledge, and saw, most of all, how I had profited by my dear girl's quick wit. I became far more humble. Most of all, I had not yet accomplished the one thing I set out to do. I had not found the man who was stopping all war. He still eluded me, and still was carrying on his dread work. I reached our hotel, feeling that I was really a very ordinary mortal after all. While I had been gone, events had been moving swiftly. Some miles out from The Hague, there was a little inn on the shore, among the dunes, over beyond Scheveningen, to which we had twice motored down during the conference. Thoroughly comfortable, a favorite meeting place in summer, for the artist colony about the watering place, it was now almost wholly deserted, because of the lateness of the season. We felt it would make ideal headquarters for our work, and soon established ourselves there. Tom was never more in his element than when assembling apparatus, or when controlling men. Here was his chance to do both. Like magic, the tall mast reared its height among the dunes, while coils, wires, and instruments fell swiftly into place. Acting chiefly as a burden-bearer, I ran to and fro, while Tom and Dorothy, with their assistance, brought things to completion. As they came in from the final stain of the aerial, Tom turned to me, wiping the sweat of honest toil from his face. "'All ready, Jim,' he said. "'If you'll start a message over that wire, we'll send it through the ether by means of Dinkle's machine and drop it straight on Tokyo. Hold on a minute, though. L let me call up my assistant on the wave measuring machine and see if he has heard anything.' A rapid conversation over the telephone we had installed resulted. 
tom turned back to me as yet i'm thankful to say nothing happened the man has evidently been experimenting this morning and was experimenting this afternoon he's right off tokyo still go ahead i pressed the key and the vibrant discharge rattled from pole to pole over and over again i gave the call to the man who has stopped all war over and over again i hurled my message out across half a world for an hour i repeated the call my eyes and ears waiting for some response from the sounder at my left let's shift the wave strength said tom and they made a hurried series of adjustments once more i took up my task and at five minute intervals for three hours sent out my call again and again we changed the strength of the wave we struggled with the insensate metal till our heads reeled at last about ten o'clock we gave up for the day dorothy and tom both were worn out and both went to their rooms my head felt too feverish to sleep so i wandered out for a final pipe along the shore struggling with the old problem which had been the theme of my thoughts for so long who was the man and how could i find him again and again regnier came to my mind as i debated the pros and cons of the ever vexing question along the sand beside the black water over dune and through the long wiry grass of the hollows i tramped till the lights of scheveningen were just ahead neither moon nor stars shone forth and my feet fell noiselessly on the yielding sand as i crossed the summit of a dune i stumbled on the prostrate body of a man lying there looking out to sea i hastened to utter apologies in french english and german but the unknown simply bowed courteously and started back in the direction from which i had come some smuggler i presume i said to myself for want of anything better to do i may as well dog his steps on and on in the blackness went my stranger his head bowed as if deep in thought by beach and road i followed till to my surprise as we came up to the door of the inn the man ahead entered without once turning round i hurried after him but the only occupant of the wide hall was the proprietor mustering my best french i asked news of the man who had entered an englishman said my host mad a little touched here he laid an expressive finger beside his head he has been with me for two months he eats and stays all day in his room he goes at night and looks at sea an englishman strange he had not replied to me but weightier matters oppressed me and i went to bed only to pass a troubled night haunted strangely by my chance acquaintance throughout the night he led me in a mad chase always seeming about to turn into some one i knew and wished to see but always at the moment of recognition when i was about to cry his name he faded changing into a gigantic cloudy unfamiliar form the morning brought a messenger from the city with our mail and we each found a package of letters beside our plate at breakfast one postmarked london and addressed to me in my own handwriting i seized and opened eagerly it was from hammerley i had sent him a photograph of regnier which i had received only a week before dorothy i said here is a letter from hammerley about regnier as you know i sent him that picture read it please requested dorothy i obeyed half moon street london november second dear orrington the man who came out of dr heidenmuller's locked room is not the man of your picture both are tall and dark but there the resemblance ends no allowance for the changes of a year could make them the same i am sorry that the clue from which you hope so much should have ended in a cul-de-sac i see by the papers that the possessor of this dread power has not seized his awful work the country here is in a state of wild excitement and fear over the sinking of the japanese battleship i sincerely trust that you may soon be successful in your quest yours fraternally edgar hammerley i knew it said dorothy with conviction i've told you he wasn't the man from the very first well ejaculated tom stirring his chocolate viciously i wish to blazes he was or at least that we could find out who it is and make him understand that he's a blamed fool drinking his chocolate tom rose with the remark now i'm going to find out whether the dinkle apparatus has recorded anything new during the night a few minutes later he returned with a negative shake of his head nothing he said let's get to work that day passed as had the preceding afternoon and evening twelve times an hour i sent forth the call as each hour struck tom changed the strength of the wave the morning passed the long afternoon waned and the early night came on monotonously as i pressed the key my thoughts would range outward into space peering searching striving to find some way to reach the man my only occupation was the watching of the clock 
for Tom and Dorothy were working hard in the next room on plans for altering the wave measuring machine in such a way as to make it even more effective. Directly beneath the clock on the wall, a window looked out to sea. As the evening wore on towards night, a storm rose, and the fierce wind of late autumn drove the breakers with a resounding roar on the long beach. I marked the hour as the storm reached its height. 9.05. I sent my message 9.10. I sent it again, and as I raised my eyes from my key, I looked at the window. There, pressed against the pane, was the face of a man we had long sought. I leapt to my feet. "'There's Redner!' I cried, pointing at the window. The face disappeared as I spoke, and Tom and Dorothy, springing from their chairs, looked out through the panes at the storm. In the hush of the night, the sound of breakers bore in on us insistently. "'Wild as a loon!' said Tom, shaking his head mournfully in my direction. "'Where was he?' asked Dorothy. "'Right outside that window,' I shouted. "'Come, we must find him.' We all started for the outer air, but before we could leave the room, the door opened, and Richard Regnier entered. Mental trouble showed in his unquiet look and in his hesitating hand. "'Why, Dick,' began Tom, but Dorothy, with an emphatic gesture, commanded silence. "'I beg your pardon,' said Regnier, slowly, and with evident difficulty. I saw you through the window, and I thought somehow I might have known you once, and that you could tell me who I am. Her eyes shining with pity, Dorothy spoke gently. I'm so glad to see you, Richard. Don't you remember? You are Richard Regnier, and that I'm Dorothy Haldane. You know Tom here, my brother, well, and this is Jim Orrington, whom you met one night in Washington. At Dorothy's low voice, the clouded brow cleared. The curtain rolled from the darkened eyes, and the bent form straightened. Thank God, I am Richard Regnier. But where am I, and how did I get here? he asked. You are on the coast of Holland, near the Hague, responded Dorothy quietly. I don't know how you got here. How did you come to be here? asked Regnier eagerly. We came to the Hague to the Peace Congress, and we came down here to try to find the man who has stopped all war, answered Dorothy. "'The man who destroyed the Alaska and the Dreadnought Number Eight, queried Regnier, in great excitement. "'I have known nothing since that time. "'Has he done anything since?' "'Many things,' said Dorothy sadly. "'He is doing great harm now, "'and that is why we are trying to reach him. "'We ought not to lose a minute more, Jim. "'If you and Tom will go to work again, "'I will sit down and tell Richard about the happenings of the last two months.' "'Back we went to our tasks.' And as I pounded out the message, waited five minutes, and pounded it out again, I thought of the strange suspicion under which Regnier had lain. I had believed him the man who had sunk every battleship on that fatal day. I had felt convinced that he was the man for whom we had searched so diligently for weeks. And while we searched, he had been wandering along the sands of the Holland coast. Regnier and Dorothy had sat for perhaps half an hour in earnest conversation when they rose and came over to us. Tom, said Dorothy, Dick has had more experience with wireless apparatus than you have. Suppose you let him look over the whole business. Glad enough to have him, answered Tom. It's always possible there may be an error somewhere. Step by step, Regnier examined the transmitting end of the apparatus, passed from the house to the aerial, came back, and went over the receiving end in every part. As he ended, he straightened up. If you don't mind, Tom, I'd like to change the coherer a little. I should judge that your transmitter was all right, but I question if you could get a reply from Tokyo through the coherer as it now stands connected with that sounder. Go ahead, said Tom, and I rose from my seat and went over beside Dorothy, while Regnier worked at the powdery mass in the glass tube. He took up the tube at last and held it to the light. There, let's try that, he said, and placed the tube in its supports, screwing up the terminals. Scarcely had he made the last turn when the sounder broke forth. Clickety-clack, clack, clack, clack. Dots and dashes came with the rapidity of a practice sender. Swiftly I read them off as they came to my telephone receiver. I am the man who is trying to stop all war. Is your news true? What do you want of me? Why don't you answer? I jumped to my seat beside the key and sent the answer out into the ether about us. We have only just got your answer through the receiver. Our news is true. All the nations are disarming. Why do you not seize sinking battleships? Your purpose is accomplished. I had scarcely ended when the reply came back. When did the nations agree on peace? Who are you? The nations agreed on peace and made a solemn covenant that all would disarm ten days ago, 
the four sending this message are professor tom haldane miss dorothy haldane of new york richard regnier of savannah and james orrington of new york there was a perceptible pause this time before the sounder resumed its motion then it began i believe what you say are the nations living up to their agreements as to disarmament completely i replied every one of the nations is living up to the agreement in spirit and in truth the greatest anxiety which the world feels at present is with regard to your sinking the japanese battleship and from fear of your future action there was a long pause and then the words came slowly how can i allay that fear i had been rapidly reading my sendings and my answers to the other three who sat up looking eagerly at the sounder as i read off that last question dorothy spoke up eagerly if he can communicate with us by wireless why can he not send a message in the same way to all countries i passed on the suggestion and slowly this answer came back i will send this message to the ruler of every country i send it to you first for you have saved me from causing death unnecessarily the man who has stopped all war now declares unto you that since peace has come since every nation is now disarming he will seize his labors the ships of the nations may now sail the seas without harm from him the sailors shall be safe from his hand this he will do if peace be sure and disarmament be complete but on the day that any nation violates its solemn oath and arms its citizens on that day will he rise and no ship be it battleship or peaceful merchantman bearing that country's flag shall be safe from destruction the sounder seized its clamor tom spoke in a low voice as if he feared to be overheard how can we tell he is the man and not someone else who is simply playing with us we can't afford to take risks ask him jim how can we know that he is really the man who has stopped all war i turned to my key and sent off the question back came the answer by the first letter which i erased and which was found you shall know me that settles it in my mind i said that's known to not more than a dozen people and none of them would be sending this tom meanwhile had stepped into the next room and was talking quietly to his assistant he spoke to me keep him going a minute jim i want to get a message from him is there anything more you wish to know i asked the man by wireless nothing he replied do you wish to say anything to me i could hear tom's excited voice got it just once more jim he said there is nothing more went out from the aerial then i thank you for telling me of this you have spared me and spared others much by your wisdom good-bye i ended as tom stepped from the phone his face beaming quickest thing on record that i got my man to set the machine for the wireless waves the man is using and got two records both from tokyo that sells at once for all the storm was still at its height the house rocked with the wind but the wild moan of the breakers forgotten while we talked with the man on the other side of the world now made their presence manifest the single light within shone on blackened beam and rough-hewn settle into dim but spotless corners on glistening tile and dark polished floor our little group in modern costume standing about the table where the instruments were placed seemed an anachronism we should have been garbed like rembrandt's models and in place of key relay and coherer there should have been simply one massive oaken table tom turned to regnier do you know dick what happened to your head Shh said dorothy looking quickly at regnier regnier smiled as he saw her movement you needn't worry dorothy i shall be very glad to tell you all i can he turned to tom i think the injury to my head came from the man who stopped all war end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the man who ended war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the man who ended war by hollis godfrey chapter twenty you don't mean that literally exclaimed tom regnier nodded quietly i mean that i believe my memory was deliberately taken from me by the man who stopped all war when he found i was on the track of his secret but it's rather a long story and it's well on towards morning shall we have it now or put off the tale till to-morrow to-night by all means answered tom that is providing you feel up to it i feel perfectly fit now said regnier so if y'all want to hear it i'll go back to the very beginning and tell it all 
we settled down to listen. Tom threw some coal, with a lavish hand, into the small fire-pot of the great Dutch stove. Now this is cozy. Go ahead, Dick, with your yarn. Dorothy, beside me on the big settle, gave my hand one squeeze and echoed Tom's words. Yes, go ahead, Dick. All the lights had been lowered, save for a single bracket lamp, which shone on Regnier's melancholy but expressive face. As he began, the storm changed its key, and came in steady driving force rather than in great gusts. It really began that night at Mrs. Hartnell's, he said reflectively. I was tremendously impressed by that second letter, which came out from beneath the visible one, and try as I would I could not shake off a feeling that the message was true, that the man who wrote possessed some strange and awful power which would make it possible for him to do what he threatened. When I left you that night I could not sleep. I looked at the problem from every side, and finally analyzed it down to this. If the man is to do this, he must either be a great scientist himself, or have obtained his secret from some great scientist. I went further. I made up my mind that the most probable line of work to produce such a destroying agent would be along the lines of radioactive experiments. In consequence, I went directly to work, and with the help of two assistants, I reviewed all the literature of radioactive matter which had appeared in the last five years, and made a digest of the papers, their subjects, and their authors. Then came my time of sailing for abroad, and I took the digest with me. I spent most of my time on the way over in a systematic sorting out of the men who had made the greatest advances, and who would be the most likely to obtain some great result. I finally narrowed my choice down to five. One of the five was Heidenmuller. He had published his last paper in the Zeitschrift für Physikalische Chemie in April, and had published nothing since. As soon as I landed, I hastened to get a file of the magazine, and found that in a somewhat deeply technical paper he had spoken of the possibility that a radioactive agent, powerful enough to give an ultimate resolution of any metal, might be obtained that was enough for me i started straight for london and heidenmuller as you know i found him dead but i heard the story of his death and i knew by that time that if he had possessed the secret he must have passed it on to some one else so i went to work i did not look up swinton because i found that heidenmuller's first assistant gregan had gone as wireless operator on one of the big yachts then at cowes so i went down there chartered a small yacht and spent a week hunting for Gregan. I think I wrote you from there, he said to Dorothy. You did, she replied. Regnier went on. Well, to cut that short, I hired Gregan to come back to London with me to make a thorough search of Heidenmuller's laboratories, which I had hired just as they stood. We hunted for two days without avail, when one afternoon I went down to the city to do some errands. I came back to my lodgings to find Greg in there, greatly excited. He had found the secret panel in the inner locked room which you found empty. But when he discovered it, the drawers held pamphlets and manuscripts. He had not examined them, as I had given him strict orders not to do so, and his training in the German army had made him ready to obey the orders of his superiors absolutely. I felt that I was on the road to victory, and I wished to read those papers alone, so I told Gregan I should go up there at once, and that he might be free for the evening. After dinner, I was delayed for an hour or two, and reached the laboratory only as darkness was setting in. In my excitement, I must have forgotten to lock the door after me. I went at once to the inner room, turned on the incandescents, which I had had installed, found the panel easily, pressed the spring, opened the little door whose lock Gregan had already broken, and saw before me a set of four drawers. They were filled with manuscripts. I began at the top and read the titles one by one through three drawers filled with a record of various researches in radioactive matter and energy I passed. I opened the fourth. There was what I sought, written in crabbed German script on the top first page of the series, was the title. Translated, it read thus, A determination of a new type of radioactive energy which affects the ultimate decomposition of matter. I seized the papers eagerly, and as I knelt there began the preamble. 
I had hardly read a dozen words when the light suddenly went out. I started up, the manuscript in my hands, but as I rose I was struck down and half stunned by a blow in the head. To my dazed brain a giant seemed towering far above me as the room opened to immeasurable distances and i heard what seemed a sonorous voice but what was probably the low tones of the man who stopped all war it is not safe to have the secret in other hands than mine for this mission i was doomed and i smelt a strange odour faintly recalling some of the anaesthetics which belonged to the high orders of the methane series then i knew no more i awoke here in holland without memory of my name without the slightest knowledge of where i was here i have remained till you came to bring me back to life and to my senses once more he ended and as fitting climax to his strange tale the lamp flickered out and the continuous long roll of the storm surged in once more in the fierce tattoo of its full fury we sat silent for some time our only light the red ends of our cigarettes then tom spoke anyway i devoutly trust it's all over now the end has been accomplished and the world will be the better for it in the end yet it has been at a fearful cost yes said regnier but a single great war would have meant the death of many thousands more one thing i should like to know said tom reflectively how do you account for your loss of memory i'm not sure answered regnier but if you remember there was a paper published by some germans a while ago which discussed the properties of an anaesthetic which produced a loss of memory it was one of the hydrocarbon compounds and from the odour which came to me i think my loss of memory may have come that way that's a possible solution said tom at least it will do unless we strike a better but confound it all we haven't got the man who has been at the bottom of all this well the search isn't over yet interrupted dorothy we can go on with it now we will go on with it i broke in but i think we can do it much better from new york for a while tom laughed yes he said there's no question that as long as dorothy has made up her mind to be married in new york new york is the one place from which to conduct a search for the present anyway i'm not going to tokyo i imagine the man will come right back home now the dinkel apparatus was the means to stop the man after all i said musingly it has done so much that i hope it will do the final thing of all and discover the man dorothy rose i hope it will she remarked but anyway we've sat long enough now the thing i want to know is what our host has to say of the way dick came here that was the question of the next morning but the innkeeper could tell us little ragnar had arrived in the company of an englishman who had paid his board for three months had told them to take a special care of the patient, and had left a package for him. That was all he knew. Regnier seized the package given him, and opened it eagerly. Two inner envelopes came next, and from the innermost he drew a package of five-pound notes. He counted them. "'The man didn't intend to have me starve,' he said. "'Here's two hundred pounds. He must have given them to me, for I didn't have five pounds in my pocket that night.' When the messenger came from the city with the morning papers, we read them with avidity. The man had kept his word. Every government had received a wireless message couched in practically the same words as that which he had sent us. The world might rest easy, as long as peace reigned. We met in the wireless room after breakfast. "'May as well go to work taking this thing down,' said Tom. Our work at The Hague was over, and we hastened to pack our belongings and made ready to return to London by the Hook of Holland." to the savoy we went a company of four regnier wished to get back into the world and to learn of the state of his affairs we were anxious to get back to new york by the first steamer we could reach i was especially anxious for dorothy had agreed after much urging to marry me a month after we reached new york there were no relatives to hinder and tom good old chap seemed almost as glad of our approaching marriage as ourselves I wanted to get back for another reason, too. I had been too long out of the writing game, and I felt that I could not afford to lose the momentum which my work with regard to the man who stopped all war had given me. So we secured passage on a boat leaving Liverpool three days after we reached London. The day before we sailed, I found a letter in my mail with the Royal Arms. 
it was an invitation to james orrington esq to be present at the mustering out of the last regiments of the british army in hyde park that morning we'll go said dorothy as she spoke a waiter came to my side gentlemen to see you sir i smiled as i rose that's not so thrilling a message now sweetheart as it has been any time these last months outside in the corridor was a gentleman of rather distinguished appearance whom i had not seen before mr james orrington he said inquiringly i responded affirmatively i am sir arthur braithwaite one of king's equerry he said he sent you this by me and he handed me a package and withdrew i turned away to find tom and dorothy just passing i showed them the package come up to my rooms said dorothy eagerly we'll open it there this is just like getting christmas presents the outer layers off showed a square white box i pressed the spring within lay a golden cigarette case its top held an inscription in exquisitely carved letters to james orrington esq he served the state before himself i lifted the case from its bed below was a brief note in the king's own hand beside the address and signature it bore these words i have never forgotten the service you did to england to the world and to me i looked up dorothy's eyes were veiled in a mist of tears she came to me and kissed me dear i'm so glad so proud of every bit of recognition you deserve all of it and tom wrung my hand with his old numbing grip crying bully for you old man that's the first bit of furniture for the new house there was just time for us to reach hyde park before the review and we all three crowded into a hansom and sped away thousands surrounded the reviewing field and it was only with difficulty that we found our way through our card of invitation worked wonders however and with that marvellous command of crowds which the london police possess we finally came through and found ourselves at the reviewing stand just as the band announced the coming of the troops the foot guards first with that strange down thrust of the foot relic of the marching step of many decades ago then the scots then regiment after regiment till the whole field was covered with the pride of britain's troops in their most gorgeous panoply of war the king in field marshal's uniform stood at the centre what thoughts must have racked his brain as he stood there silent erect immobile what visions of the long line of english sovereigns what memories of the thousands of reviews of centuries past when britain's soldiers left for wars of conquest or returned bearing new laurels offering new lands to the great island empire the music ceased as if by one accord the ensigns of the regiments bearing the old flags torn by shot and shell revealing in golden scroll the record of british prowess came to the front and centre then in one long line forward came the colours the king saluted and they turned and formed a compact mass of brilliant colour on the right i heard a whispered question and answer what is to be done with the colours they are to go to the abbey for a chapel of the flags i watched the pageant breathless a horse command and the troops stacked arms another and the music started up proudly defiantly in perfect formation the troops wheeled and started the march past their empty hands swaying at their sides as they passed the king saluted with raised hand the officers swords rising and falling with regular rhythm as they passed the gleaming mass of colour where stood the flags they saluted once more i could see the tears streaming from the rugged cheeks of many a war-worn veteran and my own throat contracted at the spectacle the king stood motionless at the salute as they formed after the march and stood for the last time in those ranks which had so often faced the foe the general commanding turned and raised his sword cheer upon cheer broke forth for the king and i found myself with tom good americans as we were cheering wildly though with dry throats the king raised his hand and the sound ceased he said but a single sentence soldiers of the british empire my soldiers farewell once more the cheering broke forth but through the sound came music and troop by troop they wheeled and marched away not till the last man had gone did the king move and when he turned i could see his face white and drawn with the agony of the hour he walked heavily to his carriage and drove away lifting his hat mechanically in response to the salutation of the crowd that night regnier dined with us i had never seen him so gay so brilliant he was full of his plans for an expedition to the ural mountains in search of some new deposits of platinum for which he had obtained a grant from the russian government 
He was the life of our party, and we parted from him with regret. As he left, I walked out into the courtyard with him. He turned suddenly. Orrington, he said, you've got the finest girl in the world to be your wife. You're not good enough for her. Nobody is, but I'm sure you'll make her happy. I've loved her for five years. I knew from the very first I had no chance. Goodbye, and God bless you both. I stood and watched him till he passed through the arch and was lost in the roaring tide of the strand. Poor chap, I said musingly as I turned away. Poor chap. The voyage home was uneventful. The month before the wedding we spent chiefly in making plans for our new home, which was to be a country home. Slowly dragged the days before the wedding. Twenty days, fifteen, ten, five. At last it came. As Tom and I came up to the church on the wedding day, the snow was lying on the narrow lawn, crusting the roof and eaves with glittering crystals and turning the ivy to a soft, clinging cloud. The flooding sunlight transmitted through the two great windows of the tower threw strange hues on the white tapestry and carpet of late winter. From within sounded the full diapason of the organ, breaking into rivers and floods of melody as the organist practiced his prelude to the wedding march. We swung back the door to find ourselves in the midst of a group of ushers who fell upon me with one last volley of cheering and jeering remarks as I hurried through. I hastened by them, laughing, and passed with Tom to the tiny room beside the organ where we were to wait till the moment that Dorothy came. After much discussion, it had been determined that Dorothy's uncle should give her away while Tom acted as best man. "'It gives me rather more a share in the proceedings,' he said. "'I always like to have something new in.' The body of the church was hidden from our sight, but just before us rose the altar, lit by brazen candelabra, which rested upon the altar cloth hanging in heavy folds and reached to the great mullioned window overhead, from which the Christ looks down in silent benediction. As we sat waiting, I breathed a silent prayer that I might be worthy, that our life together might be consecrated to loving service, that we might, Tom's voice broke in on my half-formulated thoughts, see the Alpha and Omega embroidered on the cloth? I nodded. And the Alpha of the whole thing came that day in Washington, when you read the letter from the man. Here's a part of the Omega the beginning and the end. How little you could dream of all that has come when you left your office to look up some stupid transports, or Dorothy imagined it when she went down to standardize that radium. But the end will never be complete till we find the man. While he roams the earth with his secret, the world is never wholly safe. So the thread that had bound Dorothy and me together wove into our wedding hour. Our conversation ended there, however, for at that moment a low bell tinkled, the first bars of the march began, and I started forward to meet my bride. Quietly, reverently, happily, Dorothy and I took up our life together. Dorothy was never more beautiful, never more womanly and sweet than when she said, I do, in her low voice, and turned towards me with a look of loving confidence. We had two weeks in the South, and then came back by special request to the Haldane House on the Long Island shore, where Tom had set up the wave-measuring machine in a laboratory which he had built on a bluff just above the beach, and in which he was still at work on new ideas. The morning after we arrived, Dorothy and I went out after breakfast to find Tom, who was bending over an inner cylinder of the machine, while the belt of metal quietly revolved. "'Got the whole thing set up just as we used to have it, haven't you?' I said. "'Yes,' said Tom. I'm always on the lookout for the man, and then, too, I've got a notion that I can make some changes in the recording apparatus that will make computation easier. Has the man been experimenting at all lately with his high waves? asked Dorothy. Yes, answered Tom. I leave the machine adjusted for them every day, but I've only heard from him twice. I always keep two or three uncharged reflectoscopes on hand as well. Some day he may go to experimenting where I can get a hold of something. I stood looking lazily out of the window. A large yacht lay just offshore, her white sides glistening in the morning sun. There was a touch of spring in the winter air. Suddenly, before my horror-stricken eyes, the yacht changed to a confused mass of boards which rose and fell on the tide. I heard a cry from Tom and Dorothy. The man! I turned. The golden ribbons of the reflectoscopes once more stood stiffly separate, and the moving belt stood still. The beam of light was just fluttering to rest almost on the zero. Out there, right out there, I shouted, come on, and throwing open the door, I rushed towards the beach, followed by the others. 
i pointed to the mass of wreckage rising and falling on the tide there there i shouted he just destroyed that yacht there's a survivor cried tom as we ran stumbling on over the rocks and sand towards a plank which bore a living man towards the shore just as we came to him he struck bottom and groped forward on his hands and knees through the waves he reached the dry sand rose and walked towards us i looked at the man in amazement i knew those features yet they were so strangely drawn and fixed so dominated by the dread compelling power of the eyes that i paused then it came to me john king i cried in amazement king came steadily onward a lightning flash illumined my brain are you the man who stopped all war i cried eagerly dorothy reached my side and clung to me as john king advanced with hesitating steps i am he answered slowly then why then why did you destroy the yacht shouted tom stammering in his excitement how how have you lived when the others perished the time to end us come said john in muffled solemn tones i alone am immune i did not think i was as he spoke a still more awful change began to pass over his features he staggered stopped and put his hand to his brow i am the last victim he went on falteringly i pay the final price the last words came in a thick gasp my secret is safe as he said that he fell and when we reached him he lay dead the expression of his face had changed again the sombre awful majesty which had illumined it was gone he looked once more like the young lad i had known and loved in years gone by whose face so well expressed his noble spirit ever impatient of injustice and wrong after the weary struggle his soul was once more poised and at rest the world and the man who stopped all war were both at peace end of the man who ended war by hollis godfrey